Hello, everyone. I'm Comron. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we will be discussing Book 2, Chapter 9 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 1 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not a replacement to reading the books. Just know that Calmron and I know this story is the best fantasy story ever written, and we're approaching this from a purely fanboy point of view. So no real critique on Mr. Erickson's work. We'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that haven't read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. A quick warning. Today's episode contains descriptions of savage mortal <laughs> cop. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> savage. I couldn't resist. A quick warning. Today's episode contains descriptions of savage mortal combat and is not recommended for children. I was going to put mortal combat with a K just to bait you into that, but you picked it up and <laughs> ran with it, which is awesome. <laughs> Also, we'd really like to hear from you, and we really do mean that. So send any feedback or comments that you have to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right, chapter nine. The chapter begins with an excerpt from a passage. Quote, on the subcontinent of Stratum, beyond Corelry's south range, can be found a vast peninsula where even the gods do not tread. Reaching to each coast, encompassing an area of thousands of square leagues, stretches a vast plaza. I, dear readers, there is no other word for it. Fashion this in your mind, near seamless flagstones, unmarred by age and of gray, almost black stone, rippled lines of dark dust, minuscule dunes heaped by the moaning winds. These are all that break the breathless monotony. Who laid such stones? Should we give credence to Gotho's hoary tome, his glorious folly? Should we attach a dread name to the makers of this plaza? If we must, then that name is Kachain Chimal. Who then were the Kachain Chimal? An elder race, or so Gothos tells. Extinct even before the rise of the Jagut, the Talani Mass, the Fork Rule Assail. Truth? Ah, if so, then these stones were laid down half a million, perhaps more, years ago. In the opinion of this chronicler, what utter nonsense. End quote. <laughs> and this is from My Endless Travels by S. Lee Mano, the dubious. <laughs> Couple of things here. Likely you already picked up that this is a reference to Ian C. Esselmont, the co-creator of the Malazan universe. You know what's funny? I did catch that this time. I don't think I never caught that before. Mm. And then an additional fact, Corelry and Stratum aren't continents that we've encountered yet. They lie to the southeast of Quantali and the island of Malaz. To learn more about what happens in these areas, you really need to read the Esselmont books, namely The Return of the Crimson Guard and Beyond. Is this taking place about the same time as Return of the Crimson Guard? I'm not sure. I'm not really sure where that world syncs up. We've kind of dropped the. I've talked. I've talked a couple times, but I am reading those books slowly but surely, and I've enjoyed them. I can't put them together in my head where they go, and as in relation to this world, even though it's the same world. Yeah. <laughs> It's hard for me to tie the two together. I think I need to reread it. I've only read it once. That's probably the largest issue here. I need to reread it, and then that might help tie some things together. Yes. Lady Envy asked, How do you measure a life, talk the younger? Please, darling, I would hear your thoughts. Deeds are the crudest measure of all, wouldn't you say? Walking at her side, talk glowered at her and said, You suggesting that good intentions are enough, lady? Lady Envy shrugged and said, Can no value be found in good intentions? Talk asked, what precisely are you trying to justify? And to me or yourself? <laughs> she glared, then quickened her pace. She said, you're no fun at all. And present this as well. I'm going to talk with Tool. His moods don't swing. Talk thought, no, they just hang there, twisting in the wind. After a moment, he thought, not entirely true. Tool had showed the fullest measure of his emotions a week past with his sister's departure. He looked ahead to the ridge that marked the borders of the Panion Domin. There was a city at the foot of those mountains, Bastion, an ominous name. He thought, and strangers aren't welcome. So why in Hood's name are we heading there? one Arms host had effectively declared war on the theocratic empire. Every description of the Panion Dominion simply added fuel to the likelihood of Dujek taking umbrage. The old high fist despised tyranny. Talk thought, which is ironic, since the emperor was a tyrant, I think. Then again, maybe not. Despotic, sure, and monomaniacal, even slightly insane. Something's awry, somewhere, maybe right here. Since her return from Kalos, with Mock in tow and his mask sporting a crimson, thickly planted kiss, Hood's breath, does the man even know? 
if I was Senu or Therule, would I dare tell him? Since her return, yes, there's been a change. A skittery look in her eyes. Just the occasional flash, but I'm not mistaken. The stakes have been raised, and I'm in a game I don't even know. I don't know the players ranged against me either. This comment about the Emperor being despotic, mm -hmm. it reminds me of when I yes. was really young. I think it was Civilization, the first one. And you could choose what type of leader you wanted to be. Absolutely. And Absolutely. from a young age, I always found being a despot the best solution for me as a player. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Because the people had a tendency to give me a bunch of problems. And I know what's best for the people. I'm the leader, you know? So <laughs> how about you? I played the same way. Yes, because <laughs> I, I know what's best. I, I'm the one leading these people. I know what's best. So of course. <laughs> these people, they start getting these ideas. I know it. How dare they? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if this is how the Lord feels about us when we come up with all these ideas. He's like, these folks, I don't get them. I just don't get it. <laughs> I wonder also what the segula etiquette is for situations like this. <laughs> Do you let the superior find out on their own? You got a little something. Uh, no, no, no. To the left. Uh, no, no, no. No, the other left. Okay, okay, okay. okay. I think you got it. He, he ain't got it. <laughs> I, I, how do you? It's like, I don't think can the I don't think the lower ranks can even address the higher ranks, can they? That's the thing. So how do you even do it? You don't. You can't look at them. No. Is there a way to respectfully approach and notify them of such a thing? There has to be something, but the fact that they haven't done anything about it says I don't know what that says. It's like they've let it be. It's like okay, maybe he's seen it. Maybe he's aware. I have no idea what goes on with these folks, man. They're so alien to us. They're almost more yeah. alien than the elder races. And they're humans. At least I think they're humans. <laughs> yeah, just a really rigidly structured social system. Yeah. The lips, that's one thing on the mask. Yeah. But it could be something like, hey, man, you got toilet paper yeah. coming out of your shorts. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like something you probably would want to know about. <laughs> I would imagine in a society that regimented that there has to most assuredly be something that allows for these kind of foibles to happen for you to be able to say something. Because I would imagine how mad would he be when he finds out that you didn't say nothing to him. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It's like you didn't respect me enough to notify me. It, that's the, the flip side of this. Yeah, yeah. So it really puts the underlings in this really precarious position to be like, I don't know what to do. Yeah because i can't win either way they didn't cover this in the training manual <laughs> <laughs> in the initiate class they didn't yes. talk about this they were too busy teaching us how to be the best warriors on the planet exactly, exactly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> i on the onboarding i did not see this in the onboarding yeah. packet you know it's like... now i'm thinking of what spoon they would use and what fork for the salad you know oh dude <laughs> I'm sure they got utensils for everything in that bunch. <laughs> mm. Talk blinked suddenly and found Lady Envy walking alongside him once again. He asked, Tool say the wrong thing? Her nose wrinkled in distaste. She said, Haven't you ever wondered what the undead think about Talk the Younger? Talk said, No. That is, I don't ever recall musing on the subject, Lady. Lady Envy said, They had gods once, you know. He shot her a glance and said, Oh? Lady Envy said, well, spirits then, earth and rock and tree and beast and sun and stars and antler and bones and blood. Talk interrupted. Yes, yes, lady. I grasp the theme. Lady Envy said, your interruptions are most rude, young man. Are you typical of your generation? If so, then the world is indeed on a downward spiral into the abyss. Spirits, I was saying, all extinct now, all nothing more than dust. Thy mass have outlasted their own deities. Difficult to imagine, but they are godless in every sense, talk the younger. Faith, now ashes. Answer me this, my dear. Do you envisage your afterlife? He grunted, then said, Hood's gate? In truth, I avoid thinking about it, lady. What's the point? We die and our soul passes through. I suppose it's up to Hood or one of his minions to decide what to do with it, if anything. Her eyes flashed. She said, if anything. Yes. A chill prickled Tox's skin. Lady Envy said, what would you do with the knowledge that Hood does nothing with your soul? That it's left to wander, eternally lost, purposeless. That it exists without hope, without dreams. Talk asked, Do you speak the truth, lady? Is this knowledge you possess, or are you simply baiting me? 
Lady Envy said, I am baiting you, of course, my young love. How would I know anything of Hood's hoary realm? Then again, think of the physical manifestations of that warren. The cemeteries in your cities, the forlorn and forgotten barrows, not places conducive to festive occasions, yes? Think of all of Hood's host of holidays and celebrations. Swarming flies, blood-covered acolytes, cackling crows and faces stained with the ash from cremations. I don't know about you, but I don't see much fun going on, do you? Ah, uh, yes, we got a first row seat to this in the prologue of Dead House Gates. The season of rot celebration and Hood's acolyte that turned out to be made entirely of flies. Yeah, that was a pretty rough introduction to Dead House Gates. <laughs> yeah, that season of rot analogy has been holding true so well this year. Yes. The flies were numerous. I don't know what was going on with that. Yes. We had that problem here, too. We had the fly problem here, and we're still having this, in, like, even though we've had some really like cold nights we've still had these warm and like today was actually warm and muggy strangely enough here which is unusual for us mm -hmm. especially for november <laughs> yeah this week we had a couple of really cool nice weather days but today again the air conditioner had to be turned on so yep. for this late in november it's pretty ridiculous yes, it is you know on the topic of flies and other winged insects that are annoying <laughs> mosquitoes in particular i saw a video that turned out to be fake of this guy that had this little radar thing that he allegedly made that had a laser attached to it and supposedly it was shooting mosquitoes out of the air <laughs> and he had a book that he collected with the mosquitoes turned out it wasn't actually doing that some engineers got in there in the comments and they're like this is impossible we've tried this and it doesn't track fast enough and you can't get a system that can track them but that would be really cool yeah. to have something that could just shoot these flies and mosquitoes out of the air yeah agreed <laughs> Talk said, can't we be having some other kind of conversation, Lady Envy? This one's hardly cheering me up. Lady Envy said, I was simply musing on the Talani mass. Talk thought, you were? Oh, right. He sighed then said, they war with the Jagut, Lady. That is their purpose, and it certainly seems sufficient to sustain them. I'd imagine they've little need for spirits or gods or faith even. They exist to wage their war, and so long as a single Jagut's still breathing on this world, Lady Envy asked, and are any? Still breathing, that is? Talk said, how should I know? Ask Tool. Lady Envy said, I did. Talk said, and? Lady Envy said, and he doesn't know. Talk stumbled a step, slowed, staring at her. Then at Tool striding ahead. He thought, he doesn't know? Lady Envy said, indeed, Talk the younger. Now what do you make of that? He could manage no reply. Lady Envy said, what if the war's ended? What next for the Talani mass? He considered, then slowly said, a second ritual of gathering? Lady Envy said, mm-hmm. Talk said, an end? An end to the Talani mass? Hood's breath. Lady Envy said, and not a single spirit waiting to embrace all those weary, so very weary souls. Talk thought, an end? An end. Gods, she might be right. What a crazy idea. If the second gathering is indeed supposed to reverse the vow, this sounds like it could be an existential crisis for the Talani mass. You know, I had never really thought about it like that, because I guess what we're hinting at here is the fact that these people, since they have outlived their deities, that if they should in the future become whole or alive again, they would have no afterworld to go to. Yeah, I'm thinking about beyond the afterworld. Some people take comfort in thinking that there will be some closure to the life, right? Where right. you have all these experiences, some good, some bad. You've done some things that you're not proud of. Maybe some closure to all of that. Right. And if there's nobody there to receive it, yeah. that would, for a lot of people, be very, very scary. Oh, yeah. Well, especially if you do wake up in an afterlife and be like, well, where is anybody? <laughs> mm. I'm here by myself, dude. That's horrifying. That would be very troubling. Yeah. And then on the topic of faith, if there are no Jagoot, I guess the faith is the fact that there are Jagut remaining. And then once that goes away... Yeah, what are you left with? Have we encountered any Jagut yet in the books? I can't remember. We had a Jagut ghost. Gothos is in Dead House. Yeah. But have we met any living Jagut? Just half Jags, Akarium is the only, okay. is the only okay. person I can think of. He's, he's half. Gethel counts. Well, does he? He does. He's living. Is he? I believe he is. Okay. Because I don't know how that works. I mean, this is where I get confused on some of this stuff. Well, sorry, this is one of the many points where I become confused on this. Because the idea to me that Hood's realm is death, correct? So everything gravitates toward death. Would that also mean that eventually 
Warrens and stuff like the Talani Masses. Warren might eventually does the Warren or does that, does that fall into his realm at some point? Do they remain unoccupied? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I'm confused. You're saying that when the Talani Mass die? Well, if everything goes to hood eventually, uh -huh. if the Talani Mass have no gods, what would be the problem? Because you're all going to wind up at Hood's door eventually. Oh, I see what you're saying. Because it sounds like a shared. They have it. There is no separation for the humans. The Jagoot. It sounds to me like the afterworld, like Hood's realm, is Hood's realm for everybody. That might not necessarily be the case. Yeah. If you existed before Hood. Exactly. So Hood's realm is a warren. So each warren is a realm that is habitable to some extent, I guess. It's a pl it's a physical real estate. Let's just put it like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So as a Christian, I have like the, would it, would it be the Christ-centered warren <laughs> that I go mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. you know, or, yeah. or is there just a generic hold of the dead which she all is what the jews would call it this is just a generic it doesn't mean heaven or hell it just means realm of the dead which is a generic kind of you know she all is you know it's good and bad both go to the grave kind of deal mm -hmm. you know it's not it's not necessarily a, a, a so i don't know i'm just kidding all i'm doing is making this more and more ambiguous and confusing i'm sorry i'll stop <laughs> i was thinking about your analogy so it's almost like in that context heaven would be a warrant in and of itself and then it sounds like hood's warren is almost like purgatory yeah and then hell would be something like chaos okay yeah i could see that okay yeah that's kind of interesting because that's how the michael moorcock stuff is involves law order and chaos and you have lords of both lords and ladies of both basically so it's, mm -hmm. it's always chaos versus order and the balance is the third agent yeah so intriguing you know actually let's back a little bit so i just thought of this talani mass they don't really die because when they are too broken to continue, they just set them somewhere. So there's nothing to collect their spirits. That's true. But if there is a second gathering, will they become mortal again? And then what if, it, <laughs> if that's what, yeah, well, I mean, I'm just saying if that's what in fact is what the second gathering is about, which I don't know, but if that's what it is about, then I'm just kind of curious, you know, it's like, well, then what would happen then? I guess it's what I, it's like, so if they come back to this realm of the living, then that would definitely be a problem when they pass from the land of the living, wouldn't it? I don't know how the rules of the system work to that degree. Yeah. I always thought the second gathering was going to be potentially a reversal of the vow, but you just kind of go to nothingness. Oh, oh, that would be where it might end. Like, it's like, okay, we're, we're done. <laughs> we're, you get Thanos, basically. Yeah, yeah, we're done. Okay, okay. I hadn't thought about it like that. Okay. That's kind of what I was thinking. That would make better sense. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question, though. A lot of variables in play. Who knows? Yeah. Talk stared at Tool's fur-clad back and was almost overcome with a sense of loss. Vast, ineffable loss. He said, you might be wrong, lady. She said, I might. Do you hope that I am, Talk the Younger? He nodded. She asked, why? Talk thought, why? Unhuman creatures sworn to genocide. Brutal, deadly, implacable, relentless beyond all reason. Talk nodded towards Tool and said, because he's my friend, Lady Envy. They had not been speaking in low tones. At Talk's words, Tool's head turned, the shelf of the brow hiding the pits of eyes that seemed to fix on Talk for a moment. Then the head swung forward once more. That will be plus five friendship points. <laughs> that is super nice. I, this has really stood out for me. I love the friendship in the beginning of this friendship, too, of Talk and Tool, that this is really, really kind of cool. It's kind of sweet. Yeah. Lady Envy said, the summoner of the gathering is among your Malazan punitive army, Talk the Younger. We shall converge within the Panion Domin. Us, them, and the surviving clans of the Talani Mass. There will be, without doubt, battles aplenty. The crushing of an empire is never easy. I should know, having crushed a few in my time. He stared at her but said nothing. She smiled and said, Alas, they will approach from the north whilst we approach from the south. Our journey ahead will be fraught indeed. Talk said, I admit I have been wondering, how precisely will we manage to cross a hostile, fanatic territory? Lady Envy said, Simple, love. We shall carve our way through. Talk thought, gods, if I stay with these people, I am a dead man. Lady Envy was still smiling, her eyes on Tool. She said, like a white hot knife through ice, we thrust to the heart of a frozen, timeless soul. Her voice rising slightly, she added, or so we suspect, do we not, Onos Tulan? Tool stopped. Balejag pulled away from beneath Talk's hand and padded forward. Gareth followed. Talk spun upon hearing three sets of swords slide from scabbards. Lady Envy said, oh, something's coming. 
I would have liked to have heard Tool's answer to that question before they got interrupted here. Oh, agreed. I would have very much liked to hear what he had to say about that. And I also, as I was reading through it again right here, was thinking about Talk's perspective on the power levels of everybody that's surrounding him. Mm -hmm. To quantify it, it's almost like a middle school football player, American football, going to the NFL. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> trying to play football with these dudes yeah. like full tackle you know yeah. <laughs> like, they're gonna get killed Did so i can see from his perspective how terrified he could be because he can't really defend himself have you ever seen the meaning of life by monty python no there is a scene where it's it's about school and the school discipline is that you have to play against the masters and it's like <laughs> It's rugby. It's rugby. Oh, it's, so, God. it's so, yeah, it's like the masters, like not the masters. And they show these, it's like these, exactly what you imagine. It's the same thing as sixth graders versus like professional rugby players. And they're getting their head, one gets their head literally torn off their shoulders. And I believe it. It's really funny though. But that's, that's exactly what I'm thinking of though. It's like not the masters. It's that's a better analogy actually, because <laughs> rugby, you look at these guys and they're missing three teeth a piece they're built like freight trains and they move like olympic athletes yeah. in speed it's ridiculous who want to do nothing but fight apparently while they're running with a ball yeah <laughs> it's really impressive i wish we had more of that here because it's really cool yeah it is it, it's it's impressive dude i was watching some highlights it was like top 10 lists of like the strongest rugby players that, that have ever been and man these guys were monsters i mean you're talking about already really impressive individuals playing and then you take the the top out of the group and it's yeah. just these guys were <laughs> i want to see it's like, I, it's like would you like to see an american rug i mean sorry an american football team fight a not, I don't know if, if fight is the right term. Play rugby or play American football against a rugby team. There's it's no, not even comparable no, because the not. pads and everything. I mean, I'm not trying to take away from the damage that American football players take, but no. like you don't have any pads and it's a completely different scenario. I think it would take quite a bit of a transition to be able to withstand that kind of stuff. Cause I think your body through use, it toughens up yeah. having all that protection. I think the American football players, you know, would probably get injured. That's kind of initially. what I'm thinking. That's yeah, what I'm it would thinking. take time to adjust. Yeah, yeah. You come to rely on the equipment, and I don't blame them. You have to have faith in it somehow. Yeah. One more point on this rugby thing before we move on. Mm -hmm. During the Olympics this year, this is a female rugby story. Okay. There was a picture of a woman. I forget what country they were from. Maybe Ireland. In women's rugby, one of her teammates jumped up to grab a ball. She had jumped over her hips were over the other lady's head and she caught the ball, but was falling backwards over her teammate. Mm. The teammate that was still standing grabbed her teammate's shorts and pulled her back over her head to her front from behind her. <laughs> Dude, the amount wow. of strength necessary to pull that off. It's just wow. crazy. That's you know, this is a woman doing it too. I was really impressed. That's it. Like, that oh is impressive, God. dude. That's very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> There are your heavies in the yeah. Malazan army right there. Yeah, there you are. There's dead. <laughs> you'll find them there. You'll find them on the shot put field in women's track. Yeah, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Shot putters for sure. Absolutely. And the hammer yeah. throwers. And, and the hammer, hammer throw. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's the next. <laughs> Talk unslung his bow and planted his butt to string it as he scanned the horizon ahead. He said, I don't see anything, but I'll take everyone's word for it. Moments later, a Kachain Shamal crested the ridgeline a hundred paces ahead. Blades flashed at the ends of its arms. Bailjag and Gareth both flinched back. Tok's recollection of such a creature, fraught with the pained memories of Trake's death, returned to him with a jolt that shortened his breath. Tool said, Kael Hunter, lifeless. He had not yet reached for his stone sword. Instead, he pivoted, faced the three Segula. A frozen moment stretched between them, then Tool nodded. What do you think he's doing there? He's he's deferring yes. to them. It's like okay. yeah, you, you could have it. Okay. It's like it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> Senu on Mok's right, Thurul on his left, and both brothers a step ahead of the third, the Segula padded forward to meet the Kachain Chamal. Lady Envy murmured, A gamble. Tool said, The time has come to gauge their worth, lady. Here at the border to the Daman, we must know our knife's efficacy. Talk knocked an arrow and muttered, something tells me I might as well throw twigs at it, as he recalled Trake's death. Tool said, wrong, yet there is no need to test the stone's power of your arrows. 
Tox said, power, huh? Fine. But that's not the problem. I've only got one eye, Tool. I can't judge distances worth a damn. And that thing's fast. I wonder what is going to happen when he hits something with these arrows. Are they going to explode or something? Exactly how are they invested? That's a really good question. I'm assuming whatever investiture might be would be somehow involved with Talan. Tool helped him shape these arrowheads, but I wonder if when he taught him how to do that, if when I wonder if it's just invested because Tool helped him? And is it just like armor piercing maybe? I don't really have any idea. Well, let's think about their swords and their axes and stuff. Maybe it's something like... It can penetrate magical barriers. Yeah, that could be. And it won't shatter. Yeah. So yeah, armor piercing, magic piercing. Yeah, that's probably more in line with what you should expect, right? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Okay, that makes sense. Tool said, leave this one to the Segula. Tox shrugged and said, as you say. His heart did not slow its hammering. The Kachain Chamal was blurred lightning as it plunged among the three brothers. The Segula were faster. Senu and Thirul had already moved past the creature, throwing savage, unerring blows behind them without turning. Mm. Mox, standing directly in front of the creature, had not backed up a step. The beast's huge arms flew past to either side of the third, both severed at the shoulder joint by the flanking brothers in their single pass. Mox's swords darted upward, stabbed, cut, twisted, hooked, then withdrew with the hunter's massive head balanced on the tips for the briefest of moments before the third flung its blade-bending weight aside and leapt to the right, barely avoiding the decapitated body's forward pitch. There you go. (laughs) Hung twister there. Yes, it is. The Kachain Chamal thundered as it struck the ground, legs kicking and tail thrashing. Then its movements ceased. Dude, this is exactly why I see them as samurai. The minimal movements along with the maximum efficacy of the attacks just seem to reflect how samurai fight. What an incredible sequence. It's almost anime-like. Oh, very. And especially like what he talks about when they made that slice under the arms, they made those savage blows without looking backwards. Yes. As they pass through them, you're like, whoa. And the fact that Mog just stands there very casually and performs this surgical removal of this thing's head. <laughs> and it's like very surgical. And what I'm assuming is less than a fraction of a second. Dude, it's amazing, dude. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, this could have been a scene out of Demon Slayer. There's a character named Zenitsu. Okay. Funny character because he is a coward while he's awake. And when he falls asleep, he's like in a trance and he's lightning fast. And okay. when he moves, it's a lot like what I envision these brothers did where he just goes past people. He's like slashing yes. and he's putting his sword away. doesn't even look to see what happened. Oh, wow. And the other thing that they, they, there was no communication between these three, they just move in. They know what to do. That's another thing. That's very cool. I can't say enough about how much I love that culture mm-hmm. among all the cultures that we learn of the seven cities cultures. I do enjoy, you know, like Kalam and quick Ben, where they came from. Mm-hmm. I do kind of like that desert life that they have over there, but as a mono culture, the Segula are very interesting to me. I agree. And I think what makes them so intriguing is because of the fact that we've not been told, we've been told so literally next to nothing about them. Mm-hmm. And that makes everything that you're told about them is always like, whoa, whoa, that's really, whoa, that's really cool. You and I both have a love of the desert and the seven cities kind of stuff. And that's almost beat to death because we spent a whole year in that desert. And I don't say that a bad thing. I mean, that's just, that we're very intimately familiar. I was going to say, Billy, we're, tell me how you really feel. It's, it's like, we're just, we're just <laughs> very intimately familiar with the desert as opposed to the segula. We're not, I don't think at any time we're ever very familiar with them ever. I know of. Yeah. Talk said, well, that wasn't so hard. Those beasts look tougher than they are, obviously. Good thing, too. We'll just stroll into the Domin now, right? <laughs> Gawking at Bastion's wonder, then beyond. Lady Envy interrupted. You're babbling. Very unattractive, Talk the Younger. <laughs> Please stop, now. Mouth clamped shut, Talk managed a nod. Lady Envy said, now, let us go and examine the Kachain Chamal. I, for one, am curious. He watched her walk ahead, then followed at a stumble. As he passed Tool, he offered the Talan I mass a sickly grin. He said, I think you can relax now, right? Tool looked at him and said, the third's dismantling, talked the younger. Talk asked, yes. Tool said, I could not have done that. I have never seen such skill. Talk paused, his eye narrowing. He said, Tool, that was glorified dissection. Are you not his match in speed? Tool said, perhaps. Talk said, and could he have done that without his brother slicing those arms off? What if the beast had attacked with his feet instead of his jaws? 
Tool, that could change the mouth was trying for all three of them at once. Stupid, arrogant. Tool cocked his head and said, arrogance, a vice of being undead, talked the younger. Tox grin broadened. He said, and yours has just been shaken, Tool? Tool said, an unfamiliar sensation. Tox shrugged, about to return and rejoin Lady Envy. The stone sword was in Tool's hands. He said, I must challenge him. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> not now. We're not there yet, man. Come on. <laughs> I love it. This is just ready to go. Let's go. I can't take it anymore. <clears throat> Grin falling away, Tox stepped closer. He said, hold on, friend. You don't. Tool interrupted. I must challenge him. Now. Tox asked, why? Tool said, the first sword of the Talan I mass must be without equal, Errol fail. Yes! <laughs> this was why we had that system in our guild in Star Wars The Old Republic. The first sword title was only held by the strongest duelist, and they had to accept challenges from anyone in the guild at any time. All that was inspired by this because it's just so cool. Yes, that is awesome. I just absolutely love, especially Tool. He's just, well, it's, he's the only Talana mask we're getting to know right now, so I'm enjoying catching the insight into him as well. I will say that I stole that title through a gimmick. I remember you telling <laughs> from me that. my friend. That's the one where we fought at the edge of the pit of the Sarlacc mm -hmm. on Tatooine, and I had an ability that would knock him off backwards it was a force push so i strategically positioned myself and knocked him into the pit that was the whole goal i wouldn't have won otherwise and he got so mad so mad Dude. i gave him the title back i was like you would have won anyway you know like i think he might have ended up beating me just for the purpose of showing that he could beat me but right it was hilarious he was so mad for a little bit i was acting like i wasn't going to give it back to him <laughs> that's i think that's hilarious because it's fair and it's like look it's, it's combat i'm sorry it's like sometimes some sand gets thrown sometimes some force bushes get used i'm oh, sorry man. <laughs> it's dirty though it's dirty it was more of a prank than anything okay okay i was a juggernaut class so i was more of a tank okay. and he was straight up dps class so it was definitely I th he had more skill than me anyway but yeah. Even then, we weren't set up for me to really win that fight. Okay. Talk exclaimed, gods, not you too. Tool set off towards the Segula. Talk said, wait, Tool. Tool glanced back and said, you share my shaken faith, mortal, despite your earlier words. Talk said, damn it, Tool. Now's not the time for this. Think. We need all of you. Each in one piece. Intact. Tool said, enough words, Errol Fail. The Segula stood around the falling Kachin Chamal. Lady Envy had joined them and was now crouched, examining the creature's corpse. Filled with dread, Tok matched Tool's steady, determined pace as they approached. Senu was the first Segula to notice them. He slowly sheathed his swords, stepped back. A moment later, Thorul did the same. Mox slowly turned to face Tool. Lady Envy stood and snapped, By the abyss! Not now! She waved a hand. Mock collapsed. Tool staggered to a halt. He rasped, Awaken him, Lady. Lady Envy said, I shall not. Senu, you and Thorul, rig up a trovoy for your sleeping brother. You two can pull it. Tool said, Lady. She interrupted, I'm not talking to you, Talani Mass. And to reinforce her announcement, she crossed her arms and turned her back on Tool. <laughs> it's such teenager-like behavior. Mm -hmm. Very much. After a long moment in which neither moved, Tool finally sheathed his blade and said, He cannot remain asleep forever, Lady Envy. You do not but prolong the inevitable. She made no reply. Talk drew a deep breath and softly sighed. What a lovely woman. She heard and turned with a heart-stopping smile. She said, why, thank you. He began to say, that's not, then stopped. Her brow knitted and she said, excuse me? Talk said, nothing. He thought, gods, nothing. It's good to see that his survival instinct jumped in there. As a married man, I completely understand what he just did there with deflecting. Mm -hmm. And he's lucky that she let it go. Mm -hmm. I am not that lucky, and my filtering mechanism is not strong enough to save me in many cases. <laughs> I agree, sir. Mine in the past has been faulty, and I've, uh, yeah, my filtering mechanism has been weak, so. <laughs> <laughs> the Travoy carrying Mach was pulled by Senu and Thorul from rigged shoulder slings. The two brothers were clearly agitated by the turn of events, but there would be no challenging the lady's will. As the afternoon waned, rain clouds approached from the north, obscuring the mountains beyond. The air grew cooler. The hills gave way to a broad, shallow valley. Three squat farmhouses were visible on the valley floor. No livestock was in sight, nor were the chimneys streaming smoke, lending an eerie quality to the pastoral scene. Nonetheless, the transition from barren plain to green pastures and signs of human activity was something of a shock to talk the younger. He realized with a faint surge of unease that he'd grown used to the solitude of the Lamatath plain. Absence of people, those outside the group, 
strangers, had diminished what he now understood to be a constant tension in his life. He thought, perhaps in all our lives, unfamiliar faces, gauging regard, every sense heightened in an effort to read the unknown. The natural efforts of society, do we all possess a wish to remain unseen, unnoticed? Is the witnessing of our actions by others our greatest restraint? This reminds me of something I heard someone say specifically about Americans that they noticed when visiting. They said you can tell a lot about someone if they return the shopping cart to the paddock in the parking lot if they don't think that they're being watched. And I think they said that where they were from in Northern Europe, everyone just returns the carts. It's an automatic behavior. Mm. Here, some people can't be bothered to return the carts. That's funny. And I agree with that. It's like, that does say a lot about folks. If when you're not being watched, if you still follow the rules, especially since you and I worked at a place that had shopping carts, um, that's one that really registers with me when you're like, I can't believe they can't put this in the daggum shopping cart corral. Come on. Is that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a matter of respect, right? Yes. It's going to roll. It's going to hit somebody's car, ding their door. Yep. Man, I was sitting in my car on lunch one day. Somebody walks up next to me and opens his door and slams it open into my car door. Mm -hmm. I open my door, I'm like, hey! And the guy's like, oh, sorry. But that guy does that everywhere he goes. Oh, yeah. Just slams his door open, dinging people's doors, damaging other people's property, doesn't care. It's crazy, man. Yes, yes it is. And people are very much like that. And trust me, this retail teaches us all this, but I work in clothing retail, and the fact that I pick up after people all day, every day, shows me that people don't care. <laughs> Billy, I try to fold the shirts Hey, as best I can. I appreciate. It. I don't care if you fold them. I'm just not that good. No, I'll, it. I'll, it's it, it's kind of it's it's we have a rule of thumb. It's real funny. If people leave stuff, I you know leave stuff all over the place, you get mad. But when customers hand it to you, or they're like, I don't know where this goes. Can you? I'll be glad to put that up for you. Thank you. Mm. you know, thank you for expressing the desire to not make a mess. That gets you brownie points with me. <laughs> Dude, I went to Macy's the other day. I had to get mm. some new shirts. When I went to try them on. The floor was covered with all the stuff that these were dress shirts mm -hmm. that go inside there. Like there's yes. the, the cardboard collar stay. There's like 10 needles in yes. each one. Yes. The floor was covered in this stuff. And oh, I guess yeah. this kind of goes to the reduction in people working on the floor in retail mm -hmm. to not clean up that stuff. But it really surprised me that it was that bad. That's how mine is. I mean, we have, I mean, mm. I have, it's, we got carpeted floors. So those needles, they're, oh. they're, they're, mm. there's hundreds in our carpet. I mean, there's nothing you can really do about it. I take a big magnet occasionally just because I just get bored and sometimes pick the things up as best I can. <laughs> You need a massive electromagnet. Yes. <laughs> you burn when out all the electronics in the it, store. When it, yeah, does the EMP to the whole mall. But I got these needles out. I got this pin on the floor. It's a safety issue. Yes, it is. <laughs> At his side, Lady Envy murmured, You are looking thoughtful, darling. Talk shrugged then said, We're not unobtrusive, are we? This group of ours. Masked warriors and giant wolf and dog. And a Talani mass. Tool stopped and faced them, then said, I shall make myself unseen now. Talk asked, when you fall to dust the way you do, are you entering your Talon, Warren? Tool said, no, I simply returned to what I was meant to be, had not the ritual taken place. It would be unwise to employ Talon within this domain, Talk the Younger. I shall, however, remain close and vigilant. I have trouble understanding this right here. I would assume that some level of sorcery was in play to keep their consciousness together when they fall to dust. Yeah, and I don't get it either, because... There has been things said, this book in particular, like when we go to uh, Kapistan, like when the, the Talani mass follow that gray sword in, they follow them with the, with the wounded people on the Travoy themselves, but yet they're able to reconstitute themselves when they need to. So that implies, I almost feel like if he returns to what he should be, I was assuming that for an ancient being like that, that would be nothing. So how would he be able to return from nothing? See, I'm confused. I don't, you know, how is he aware of need, being needed? Kind of deal. Yeah. It's Sandman. Right? From Spider-Man. Yeah. That's a very unusual power right there. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's the only thing I can think of that's even yeah. remotely similar. Yeah, I think you're right. It's just the consciousness resides in every every speck of it, I guess. I, I, I'm curious. Talk grunted, then said, I was used to having you around. In the flesh, I mean. He scowled, then added, as it were. Tool shrugged, then vanished in a sluice of dust. Lady Envy said, other solutions present themselves with respect to our canine companions. Observe. She walked towards Baljag and said, you, pup, are far too alarming in appearance in your present form. Shall we make you smaller? Baljag had not moved and watched as Lady Envy reached out a slim hand and rested a finger on its brow. 
Between blinks, Balejag shifted from tall and gaunt to a size to match the dog, Gareth. Smiling, Lady Envy glanced southward and said, Those yellow wolves are still following, so very curious, but it seems unlikely they will approach now that we are among humans. Alas, reducing the Segula to the size of children would achieve little in the way of anonymity. Wouldn't you concur, Talk the Younger? Talk conjured in his mind an image of two masked, death-dealing, quote-unquote, <laughs> children, and a moment later his imagination was in full retreat. He said, uh, no. I mean, yes, yes, I concur. <laughs> That would be a funny picture. It would be. I agree. I immediately thought of Diablo 2, the jungle, with the pygmies oh my attacking. Word. I hadn't thought about Diablo. That, that's, the, that's the last Diablo I've played. That is so funny. But yeah, I yeah. remember the pygmies. <laughs> and then I think they were in the Mummy 2, very similar type scenario yeah. towards the end of the movie. Yeah. Lady Envy said, The hamlet yonder will prove a modest test as to how the locals react to the Segula. If further illusory adjustments to our party prove necessary, we can address them later. Have I covered all considerations, my dear? He reluctantly rumbled, yes, I suppose. Lady Envy said, the hamlet might have an inn of some sort. Talk said, I wouldn't count on it, lady. These trader tracks haven't seen use in years. Lady Envy said, how uncivilized. Shall we make our way down there in any case? The first drops of rain were spattering the stony trail when they reached the first of the hamlet's half dozen squalid and ramshackle buildings. It had once been a traveler's inn, but was now unoccupied and partially dismantled. The wood and dressed stone of the kitchen wall scavenged, leaving the interior exposed to the elements. Three small buildings lay just beyond the abandoned inn. Smithy and tax stall, and a tithe collector's office and residence. All lifeless. The only structure showing evidence of upkeep was on the other side of the shallow ford. High-walled, all that was visible of the structure within was a pyramidal peak scaled in polished copper. That's interesting. A pyramidal peak on the roof of the temple. How do you envision the architecture for that? You know, it's kind of funny. I didn't, I never really thought about it until this. I'm going to just have to assume it's kind of shaped like a pyramid, I guess, is the only thing I could think of. I did some looking up of temples that had pyramidal structures. The, the closest thing that I found was those Buddhist temples or temples in India. The, it's not really a pyramid, though, the way I envisioned it. Right. They had some that were four-sided I was going to say, you could have a four walls and cap it off with a pyramid top, you know, and just be Yeah, but you rarely see that in a temple. I was just trying to think of what do I really think this architecture looks like? Because for some reason, I always associated that Prince Jellarkhan's weird palace Mm -hmm. with a lot of the architecture of the Panyan Daman, but that's not really the case. I don't know, but it always seemed different than the rest of the stuff that we've been dealing with on this continent. Yeah. I agree. Maybe the Panyan Doman erected this in the middle of this place. Maybe, maybe it's not original. Maybe it's new and they've put it here. Yeah. But still, what theme are they following? I you know. Yeah, I'm just that's curious. a good question. Good question. Talk muttered, I'd guess that to be a temple standing in the center of the Hamlet's Lone Street, his eye narrowing on the building on the other side of the stream. Real quick, Erickson does an amazing job with talk referencing his single eye in all of these sentences. I was yeah. noticing that. Today. I was like, man, he's very consistent with this. Oh, I appreciated yeah. that. Yes, I, I agree. I, I appreciate that too. Lady Envy said, indeed, and those within are aware of us. Talk shot her a glance and asked, how aware? She shrugged and said, we are strangers from Lamatath. A priest within has the power to quest, but he's easily led. You forget, I have had generations in which to perfect my innocuous persona. Talk thought, innocuous? Hood's breath, woman, have you got that wrong? (laughs) Lady Envy said, I already have the priest in hand, my dear, all unsuspecting, of course. Indeed, I believe if we ask, they will grant us accommodation. Follow me. He stumbled after and asked, accommodation? Have you lost your mind, lady? Lady Envy said, hush, young man. I am feeling amicable at the moment. You wouldn't want to see me cross, would you? Talk said, no, absolutely not. Still, Lady Envy, this is a risk we... Lady Envy said, nonsense. You must learn to have faith in me, Talk the Younger. She reached out, curled an arm about his lower back, and pulled him close. She said, walk with me, dearest. There, isn't this nice? The brushing contact of our hips, the sudden familiarity that sends the heart racing, the dampness of the rain matching. Talk interrupted, yes, yes, lady, please. No more details, else my walking proved most awkward. (laughs) (laughs) She laughed and said, I believe I have finally succeeded in charming you, my love. And now I wonder, upon what path shall I lead you? So many choices. How exciting. Tell me, do you think me cruel, talk the younger? He kept his gaze on the temple. 
They stepped into the cool water of the stream, the flow swirling around their ankles, but no higher. At length, he replied, Yes. Lady Envy said, I can be. In fact, I usually am. I suspected you always knew. I sympathize with your desire to resist, you know. I don't like seeing her torment our boy here. I'm just glad he has enough sense to resist. Yeah, me too. I don't like her getting them all riled up either, but I appreciate talk. Keeping it together. <laughs> yeah. Together, keep it together. Keep it. <laughs> Exercising discipline here is really important. I was wondering at the driving force there, because I imagine is exceedingly difficult with the way she is, because she's very practiced in this manipulation technique. Mm. It's got to be a couple of things. Number one, he knows she's an elder with extreme power. Why would she be interested in him? There's a big mismatch there. Number two, his disfigurement. You know, he's mm -hmm. incredulous as to why she would be attracted to him, given how he looks now. Yeah. I don't know. Do you think that's kind of helping him maintain his... I think so. He he has specifically talked about her in the fact, you know, like he's terrified of her. He's not hit this. She's obviously something to be able to keep the three segula and, you know, tool traveling these other, and the bell jag and the, the wolf and the dog with him. I mean, so there is something to her, but the way that she does him, I am proud of him because that would be hard to resist. <laughs> he's a better man than most men. Well, most men are idiots because the logical thing here is all those factors that I mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing that whatever spell she's trying to spin is ultimately the game for her. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I agree it is. Yeah, but most men would like to believe the lie, obviously. Oh, yeah. oh I'm going to be with Lady Envy. Oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> she's this ancient woman in me. It, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect it's sense. Like, <laughs> it's like, bro, Anna Amanda Rake wasn't enough? Chill, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't stand a chance, bro. <laughs> Lady Envy asked, what lies ahead, do you think? Talk said, I don't know. Well, here we are. Do we knock? Lady Envy sighed and said, I hear the patter of feet. The door on their left creaked open, revealing a naked, emaciated man of indeterminate age, pale skinned, head and eyebrows shaved, his watery gray eyes fixed on Lady Envy. The man said, welcome, mistress. Please enter. The Panyan Daman extends its hospitality. His eyes flicked past her to take in the wolf and dog, then the segulet. He continued, to you and your companions. He stepped back. With an unreadable glance at talk, Lady Envy followed the priest. All right, we're going to stop there this week, and we will finish out the chapter next week. For standout moments, Lady Envy's surprisingly philosophical discussion with talk about what happens to your soul when you die. Yeah, I really appreciated that from her because she has only shown us this adopted airhead personas that she has which we have to know that if she's hung out with some of these elders she's not what she appears to be but she sure gives it her all that she's kind of just clueless and sweet and, <laughs> and kind of naive it's like, and i don't believe any of it yeah i thought it was a really good amount of introspection and i really appreciate that conversation yeah actually. i did too very much the efficacy of the segula against the kachain chamal Given all we've seen in the encounters thus far, it goes to show just how terrifyingly proficient these warriors are. Agreed. They are very proficient. But you got to wonder, why would they only send three? I mean, because if, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think it matters how many folks you got, how awesome you are at your skills. If you're outnumbered by people who just sheer numbers stack up on top of you, couldn't a human wave take these folks out? Why send more than you need, Billy? So you're right if they stood against an entire army, but maybe it's more of a clandestine thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, if it's one of these like SEAL Team 6 kind of things, then I get it. And you send the three. I get it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's like we found Osama bin Laden. Let's We're sending it. in SEAL Team 6. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. basically the vibe okay. I'm getting. Okay, right? I think you're right. I think now that you put it like that, I think you're right. It's like, okay, we're going to go. We're just going straight for the killing of the Panion Seer. Okay, we got yeah, a, we got a shot. So. But these three guys, we got a shot. Let's go. <laughs> Tool's bewilderment at Mock's skill in taking down the Kachain Shamal and his immediate move to challenge him to test himself. Oh, and that's such a core memory right there. And uh, just the fact he just couldn't stand. He, I just, he has to know. And the fact that he makes that statement about, I could not have done that. What Mock did when removing that thing's head, like he was just kind of artfully doing it. Like he was just had all the time in the world as this thing. And those things move fast. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. they come in what club 30 40 miles an hour they're coming through there pretty quick and it's like if he just casually just makes a few slices here a few slices there hook 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 heads on there flip it away it's like wow and yeah the fact that tool doesn't know could not be better that's kind of troublesome to me i'm trying to game out what it would look like for those two (laughs) thinking about the skill levels of the two how long tool's been alive and the fighting styles that we've seen thus far and i think that The impression that I have of Tool is he's incredibly fast. He has a ton of experience. Oh, yeah. Years and years of experience. But I don't know that he had a formal training program against people that are focused entirely on fighting. That's a really well stated. I hadn't thought about it like that. Yeah, that he's not. The Talani Mash are not a race that we are aware of that they were a dual-centered culture. We've agreed that they seem to be more like, like the old school Siberian tundra nomads, you know? That's kind of always my impression with these folks for some reason. The analogy comes to me of like mixed martial arts versus some of these other martial arts that haven't been exposed to systems outside of their own, really. Mm -hmm. And mixed martial arts has progressed extremely rapidly over the last 30 years. Some martial arts have proven that they cannot withstand being tested with what people are using now, which is the best parts of multiple different fighting styles. And it's evolving. Yeah, that's true. On one aspect, the Segula, you know, it's a monoculture. So they are a martial art that is really limited, but they're solely focused on that as a culture. So it makes me wonder if they do branch out and see other fighting styles, like they go challenge themselves and find ways to counter specific fighting styles, maybe? I don't know. That's a good question. I'm going to just make a large assumption. I would assume that being this good of a warrior class, I would assume that they're not just limited to just the sword. I would think that there's multiple training regimens involved. I'm sure it involves hand-to-hand combat as well, because you lose your sword, sword breaks, whatever. Yes. And finally, talks continued discipline in resisting Lady Envy's toying with him. Yes, that's very well done, sir. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm really proud of him for being able to stand his own and be able to just be like, just don't look. Just don't even look. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Keep it together. Keep it together. Keep it together. Oh, All right, great job tonight, hey, Billy. Man, great, great episode, man. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? Oh, just what a great episode. But I particularly love, even though it wasn't a whole lot, but it's in there, that stuff with talking tool. That's always stuck with me because it's, I love friendship. I love good friendships and it's an unusual friendship. And uh, the fact that tool even has emotions and would want a friend of a kind is really wild to me. Because I always think of the undead as completely soulless and having nothing other than just observational powers, if that. And it does not seem to be the case with him. He seems to be something's happening and it's just it, i just love seeing what's going on with him and, and talk in particular that's a good point actually that when talk said that he didn't want to see that happen with the second gathering and the disbanding of the talani mass and he's he admitted that he didn't want it to happen because tool was his friend yeah tool's response to that i mean he really wasn't another response but his acknowledgement of it yeah yeah that was another standout moment yeah. actually it meant something to him it meant something very yeah. much to tool all right thanks everybody we'll see you next week See y'all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.